The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and good morning to our friends on the West Coast. My name is Jennifer Schaus, and we are here today with Ed Delisle, focusing on a webinar uh, that highlights the Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business Verification, uh, or on our government acronym, the SDVOSB. Uh, verification process. Uh, the, re, the webinar will be recorded and available for download probably tomorrow. We'll have that as a YouTube video. Uh, all attendees are in listen-only mode, so if you have questions, on the right-hand side of your screen you should see uh, a little section there for questions. You can type in your questions. Once we get through the, uh, the webinar, we'll go through and read each question instead of interrupting uh, our speaker. Uh, OK, so we will uh, we'll dig into this. And first of all, I wanted to just uh, thank some of our, uh, our sponsors and friends, FedBidSpeed and Fierce Government. Uh, FedBidSpeed is a uh, software company that focuses on government contractors, and they provide it's more or less a CRM, uh, customer relationship management tool for government contractors. So once you find RF, RFIs, RFQs, and various solicitations on FedBiz Ops, FedBiz Speed has a program that allows you to manage those opportunities, share them with your colleagues, assign tasks uh, as far as the proposal writing and managing uh, the opportunity and to completion. Uh, our other colleagues at Pierce Government provide a free government IT newsletter. Uh, if you look at what they are putting out as far as content and quality, it's far uh, above and beyond what the other uh, government IT newsletters and, uh, and publications are putting out. So if you have a chance uh, sometime today or this week, feel free to jump onto the website for that this feed uh, as well as Pierce Government. Uh, our speaker today, as I mentioned, is Ed Delisle. He's an attorney with Cohen Siglius, and they are based out of Philadelphia. Ed is in D.C. Uh, probably about two or three times a month, I would say. Um, and their firm focuses on both commercial and public contracting uh, with a focus on construction, government contracts, and small business procurements. Uh, Ed's going to be leading the, uh, the discussion today. Again, my name is Jennifer Schaus. I've got a boutique government contract consulting firm based in Washington, D.C. Our primary service is helping uh, government contractors with the GSA schedule process. We also have support uh, through various partners that provide help with federal sales and marketing, BCAA audits, 8A certification, uh, and various other components of government contracting. Over the last couple of weeks and going forward for about another three weeks, we've got a series of webinars coming up on different topics uh, and some events that we're putting on as well. Uh, I've got a couple of these listed here. This Friday, we've got a, uh, a webinar on social media for sales and marketing. Uh, we're doing one on Monday on the FOIA request. I don't think uh, too many people are leveraging FOIA requests, but it's a great way to help obtain information and use it to propel your B2G strategy forward. Uh, we're also going to be exhibiting at the OSDABU conference, which is the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. It's a great conference, very well attended, uh, so feel free to stop by. I'll be in booth number 410. And then I've got listed there a couple other webinars that we're doing, and then an event on May 3rd out in Sterling, Virginia, uh, at a, I believe it's a Panera out there, organized by uh, Coach Marvin Powell on leveraging contacts and social media for success. OK, we will now uh, jump into our feature presentation. And I will hand the controls over to Ed Delal, who's going to focus again on the SDVO uh, certification. Ed, it's all you. Jennifer, thank you very much. And welcome, everyone. Uh, several years back, SDVO SD verification became uh, all the rage. It was something that was brand new in 2010. And it had its origin really going back to 2006 with the passing of the Veterans First program, which within the context of the Department of Veterans Affairs placed SDVOSB companies, that is service disabled, veteran-owned small businesses, 
and VOSBs, veteran-owned small businesses, at the top of the pecking order in terms of uh, VA procurement. Uh, after the Veterans First uh, Act was passed in 2006, you had the passage of the Veterans Benefit Act in 2010. And that's what really marshaled in this verification process that we're going to talk about today. The, um, the verification uh, process is something uh, very different than what used to exist. Uh, immediately after the Veterans First program started back in 2006, it was what we call a, a self-certifying system. Now we see on the screen here this reference to a dual system because uh, there is still, to this day, a self-certifying system when it comes to service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, uh, and that is through the Small Business Administration. If you go to 13 uh, CFR 125.8, that particular regulation begins the discussion of the SBA's um, SDVOSB program. That program uh, would pertain to procurements that are non-VA related. For VA related procurements, the VA has its own set of regulations. And you'll see those up on the screen as well. 38 CFR 74.1 begins the discussion of the VA's process uh, of verifying and determining who should be verified under their SD VOSB program, which would then allow companies who are verified to take advantage of contracts uh, that are set aside for those particular entities, and those would be VA procurements. The, uh, the VA verification uh, process and the SBA uh, self-certifying process are similar in terms of what their criteria are. In fact, the VA system as it stands now uh, was modeled after what the SBA had put in place uh, prior to what the VA has now. And if we go to the next slide, Jennifer, thank you. And you'll see uh, what these eligibility requirements are. And again, the SBA self-certifying program has the same uh, general criteria, the most important of which are the first uh, two that you see on your list, ownership and control, and the last, size. In terms of uh, the VA's verification process, which is our, our focus today, the regulations, of course, require, uh, in order to be eligible, that a service-disabled uh, veteran own and control uh, a company for purposes of obtaining that verification. And we're going to get into those specific criteria in a few moments in a bit more detail as they're the most, most important criteria. The VA regulations require uh, good character, and that's specifically spelled out in the regulations themselves. And what that means is you can't, you, you personally or uh, uh, the company itself cannot be on a uh, debarred or suspended list. Uh, false statements, can't make them. Uh, if at any point in time during the verification process it's determined that, uh, that you make a false statement of any kind, then uh, you would uh, render yourself ineligible for verification. Uh, federal financial obligations, uh, you have to pay your taxes. And if you haven't paid your taxes, if there are tax liens uh, out there attributable to you, you do not qualify for, uh, for verification. The final component of uh, VA uh, verification would be size. You have to be small. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well uh, because uh, size is certainly an important factor in determining whether you are eligible. Uh, as, I, as I just stated, the two most important criteria are the first two, ownership and control. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about those two criteria first, and then we'll discuss size uh, a bit. Well, what does ownership mean under the regulations to obtain verified status? If you want to become uh, verified by the VA, uh, your company has to be 51% unconditionally owned by a service-disabled veteran. What that means is uh, that ownership cannot be subject to any conditions. It can't be restricted in any way. You must, you must actually have control over 51% uh, of the voting stock of a corporation, for example, uh, for purposes of qualifying. Uh, if it's a partnership, it's actual 51% control over uh, the partnership itself. 
Same holds true if it's an LLC. Uh, you have to be in control of 51% of each class member interest of that particular LLC. You must be, in essence, free to make all decisions uh, for the company based upon owning majority interest in that company. The regulations um, also talk about unconditional ownership, meaning that ownership has to be direct. What does that mean? It means that the applicant, meaning the person, uh, has to actually be the owner of the company. The regulations uh, themselves uh, state that an applicant or a participant that's owned principally by another business uh, that is in turn owned by one or more veterans or service disabled veterans does not meet the criteria for that particular requirement. So the ownership itself has to be direct. The veteran owner has to own the entity that's applying for verified status. Uh, unconditional ownership also means that you're entitled to at least 51% of all profits of the entity. And that has to be uh, set forth in the governing documents for the entity for purposes of satisfying this unconditional ownership uh, aspect of verification. There's a reference there to transfer restrictions. It used to be until very recently, within the last uh, month or so, that things like rights of first refusal in your ownership documents uh, were impermissible, were not permissible. That's changed. Uh, I was involved in a, in a case several months back called Miles Construction versus the, the United States where, where we challenged the VA's uh, ability to prevent someone from becoming verified or uh, from throwing them out of the program for having rights of first refusals in uh, your ownership documents. The, uh, the VA has, since that case, the VA has changed its, its opinion on that and has now taken the position that normal commercial practices uh, will not prevent someone from becoming verified and are specifically, uh, and that's specifically with respect to these transfer restri restrictions which they once deemed to be so problematic. And for those of you who are, who are curious and don't know, a right of first refusal would be, for example, uh, something in your ownership documents which says you as the veteran would, uh, if, if you had a solicitation from a third par party to buy your shares for a million dollars, that you would first have to go to your uh, partners, let's say you, you own the company 51%, 49%, you'd have to go to the 49% owners first and, and offer to sell them your shares for, uh, for the amount that the third party was willing to buy it for. Those sorts of things are, are now deemed to be permissible, uh, again, as long as it, is, it falls within the confines of normal commercial practices. That's, uh, that's something very new. If we can go over to control, what does control mean? So we know what ownership means under the YA regulations. What does control mean? Control means that the service disabled uh, veteran has to manage day-to-day -day activities and uh, set long-term goals uh, for the company. It, it makes sense, but many times what happens is you'll have uh, service disabled veterans who will uh, partner with uh, folks from their past, which can become problematic. For example, you can have an employee who's a service disabled uh, veteran start his own business and uh, ask a, part, a, a former employer of his to be his partner. And the issue then becomes, well, wait a minute, who actually controls the business? Is it the former employee or uh, the employer? Uh, the roles are, are flipped in this situation, but is the, is the employer or the former employer attempting to take advantage and really controlling the employee uh, who's attempting to obtain uh, verified status through, through the VA? And where we talk about affiliation, uh, affiliation uh, relates to exactly situations uh, like that. Or is the service disabled veteran owned small business actually controlling its own affairs or is it being controlled by someone or something else? That's what affiliation is. Is it being controlled by a non-service disabled company? Is that non-service disabled company a large business concern or connected to a large business concern. That's what control means or, or refers to in the context of the VA's 
a requirement that the service-disabled veteran control uh, his or her business. Size is also an important criteria for purposes of qualifying under the VA's program. Uh, size is something that will always go back to the, to the SBA. Uh, the, the SBA is uh, the arbiter of who is and who is not uh, big or small, as the case may be. And the, uh, the levels of what is and was, what is not small, whether it be dollar value or if it's an employee-based standard, those are dictated by the SBA, and those are the standards that are used for purposes of determining whether you're small uh, in terms of qualifying under the VA's program. There are some examples there of, of what the current uh, threshold values are for, for different businesses. If you're in construction, a general contractor, it's uh, $33.5 million. Uh, for specialty trade subcontractors, electrical, plumbing, painting, that sort of thing. It's $14 uh, million, dollars, and that's average annual receipts over three years. Uh, for manufacturing, for certain types of manufacturing, uh, it's 500 employees. And these, these are just examples. There, uh, are, there are employee-based standards that are 750 uh, employees, others 1,000, and um, there are other dollar thresholds as well. But it's important. You have to make sure that when you uh, submit your application that, in fact, you are a small business in addition to being owned and controlled by a service-disabled veteran. So how do you apply? Well, again, it used to be uh, before 2010, the way that you applied was uh, you simply uh, self-certified. Uh, you went on to the VA's uh, website at vetbiz.gov and you entered your information and that was all that you had to do. Well, now you, you go there and you go into their, what they call their vendor information pages, uh, and you submit information electronically to the VA and an arm of the VA called uh, the Center for Veterans Enterprises, CVE, uh, acts as the clearinghouse for those applications. If you're unsure about whether or not you've uh, properly or appropriately assembled the information necessary to determine whether you're qualified, they have what they call VABs, uh, Verification Assistance Briefs, that are on the website that are designed to assist applicants in assembling the information that they need to become verified. And you should certainly review those uh, before submitting your information to the VA. In terms of how long it takes, uh, right now what the VA is telling folks is it takes about 50 days uh, to uh, review and determine whether some, someone is or is not eligible initially. If uh, there's a requirement that, or not a requirement, but if, if you get denied, uh, you can ask for reconsideration. It's a much longer period of time uh, for one reason or another the VA to get through a reconsideration request. And what the VA is telling folks today is that it takes about 120 days for them to reconsider uh, whether or not you should or should not be verified. The approval rating as it stands the end of March 2013, uh, they're saying is about 65%. Uh, percent. That's consistent with, um, it's a little bit higher actually, but it's, it's pretty consistent with uh, what we saw last year. Uh, it's lower than a lot of uh, service disabled veterans would like to see, but I think part of the problem with the system is that it's still uh, a system uh, where the kinks are being worked out. It's, it's still developing. It's changing. Uh, and you should, uh, keep for those who are interested, keep your eyes peeled uh, because we are anticipating seeing more changes in the actual verification process itself between now and the end of the year, probably uh, coming in the next several months. So that's uh, a quick review of the, uh, the Veteran Association, or the Department of Veteran Affairs, excuse me, uh, their, uh, their SDVOSB verification uh, process, ownership control, extremely important, size, very important, and uh, happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Anne. It was very uh, informative and educational, even uh, for me. Uh, looks like we've got some questions coming in, so I will read those off to you. Um, first one reads, mm -hmm. how long does the certification last? 
certification lasts two years, uh, it, and that changed. Up until June of last year, it was one year, and the VA changed their policy uh, regarding the length of time that one uh, was permitted to be verified because they just simply couldn't get through the renewal process uh, quick enough. It became an administrative nightmare for the department, so they pushed it to two years. So as it stands currently, it's two years. If my company merges or is acquired by another, and I am and I hold the SDVO certification, uh, can this certification be transferred to the new company? Well, any any change uh, in the company, any in, any change in the makeup of ownership, is something that needs to be reported uh, to CVE, the Center for Veterans Enterprise, which uh, controls the verification process, uh, and they, and they have to be told when such an event occurs so that they can determine whether or not the company that's left or the, the, company that, um, the companies that merge if, if the uh, SDVOSB status can be maintained. In some instances it can, in some instances it can't, uh, but what you definitely do have to do is make sure uh, per the regulations that you notify uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs that that's happened. Uh, if my application is denied, how long do I have to wait to reapply? If you are denied and, and opt not to ask for reconsideration, or if you ask for reconsideration and you're ultimately denied, the regulations uh, state that you have to wait for six months until you can reapply. Okay. Is there an in-person application or interview associated with the certification? Many times uh, there is. It's not uh, something that's mandatory, but most of my clients who go through the process have had an in-person uh, interview. And what will typically happen is someone uh, from CVE or a, an independent contractor hired by CVE, which more often than not uh, has been the case the last year, year and a half, uh, they will come to your place of business they will review your business records oftentimes with you and ask questions about uh, who you are, uh, who you conduct business with, uh, who your employees are, things of that nature, but it very often will occur in your uh, pl principal place of business. Okay. Do a certain percentage of my employees also need to be veterans? No. Uh, the the service disabled veteran owned uh, business verification status is based upon ownership, and ownership needs to be uh, fifty one percent. Uh, it, could, it doesn't have to be necessarily one service disabled veteran. It could be a number, but the the group has to constitute at least fifty one percent of that ownership group. They all have to be service disabled veteran owned uh, folks or service disabled folks. Are all VA contracts awarded to SDVOs only? No, but they're given uh, highest priority. SDVO uh, SBs are given the highest priority. VOSBs uh, are given second highest priority, and and it sort of goes down the line, uh, you know, from there. Uh, after that, it's it's eight A's, women-owned businesses, uh, hub zones, and you sort of go down the pecking order in that fashion. Should I first obtain 8A certification and then pursue the SDVO? Will that make the process easier for me? I don't think it will make the process any different because both um, processes are independent of one another. I've had uh, clients uh, do both. I've had some pursue uh, their SDVO SB verification first. That's, that, I guess, as I think about it, tends to be the way most of my clients do it. They'll, they'll go and they'll uh, attempt to get SDVOSB verified first, and then they'll go through the, um, the 8A application process. I don't know that there's necessarily any advantage uh, doing it one way or the other. They're independent. Okay. Does DOD also give preference to SDVO companies? Well, what they do is they have, uh, they have their own uh, programs where they have goals. I mean, everyone, uh, all of these agencies have, have goals. The goal across the, the government, of course, for small business is 23%. And the goals uh, in the various different agencies 
are uh, 3% when it comes to service-disabled veteran-owned uh, small businesses. So what they do is they try to, uh, to hit that 3% mark per year uh, you know, based upon their, whatever their procurement levels are for that, for that given year. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to hit those, uh, those goals in some fashion. Do they give preference per se? I wouldn't call it preference, but they all have their goals that they need to meet. And they will, they will issue procurements such that they can hit them. Are they successful in hitting uh, those goals? Eh, it's, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. More often than not, uh, that particular goal for service-disabled uh, companies has been missed. Does the SDVO certification designate gender? I'm sorry, does it? Uh, designate gender, so male or female does veteran? It, does it designate gen, uh, gender? Well, I don't know. If I, if I understand that to mean differentiate be between one versus the other, the answer is no. Uh, you're going to indicate that you're male or female uh, as part of the application process, but it has no bearing uh, one way or the other. Uh, in terms of whether or not you obtain your verified status. There's a whole separate program uh, devoted to women-owned businesses through the, um, through the SBA. Okay. Uh, how does a PEO relationship impact your status as an SDVO? How does, I'm sorry, how does what relationship? Uh, a P, PEO, and I'm not sure what uh, that acronym is standing for. Well, I'm not 100% sure I know that either. If it's if it's uh, if it's an ESOP, for example, um, if it's an ESOP, it becomes more, which is an employee stock uh, ownership plan. If that's if that's what we're talking about, it, it can make it difficult uh, to become uh, to become verified. And the regulations actually talk about this in. Uh, 74, uh, 38 CFR 74.3 when they talk about direct ownership, which I touched on a little bit. Direct ownership means that the service-disabled veteran himself or herself uh, has to be the person that primarily owns the company. And when you're talking about um, employee-owned companies, you know, ESOPs, the, the specifically, the regs specifically state that that does not meet the direct ownership requirement. So that does become a problem, assuming that's what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, next question reads, I represent a disabled veteran who used to be a top executive for a company that his newly created business now does work for. The disabled veteran completely controls the new company. Uh, but the SBA claims that since he was an executive vice president for the large business, he does not qualify for SBA certification. Can you explain whether this truly would fall under affiliation? Well, it sounds like uh, there could be a couple of problems uh, with that situation. The, the situation, it sounds like it's through the SBA's regulations, not, I think that's what I, what I heard, not the VA's. And it's, and that, they look at things slightly differently. The VA's um, process is, was modeled after what SBA has, but they are independent uh, from one another, and there are differences. The SBA, uh, the SBA may may have deemed there to be an affiliation uh, problem based upon the the close association between the the former employee who. I, who I guess is a service-disabled veteran, uh, and the uh, the company with with whom he used to work. Um, I don't know. I guess they're, they're very fact-specific. So if if there's something that I can help you with, sort of offline, I, I'm happy to do that. Um, but it sounds like there might be you know something more in play there uh, than what we're talking about in terms of the VA's system and uh, verification process. If the, and I'm going to, everything here is being recorded just to let everybody know. I'm going to just advance to the next mm -hmm. slide so you've got Ed's uh, contact information, but we still have a couple more questions uh, mm -hmm. coming in here. Sure. Uh, if the certification lasts for two years, after my certification mm -hmm. expires, can I then reapply? Yes, there is a renewal process. The um, 
the renewal process is easier, uh, which makes sense, than the initial application uh, process. And what you'll need to do, again, it's all electronic, you will uh, resubmit information uh, that, you've, that you submitted initially, since you've already done it once, it's not, it's not nearly as, uh, as difficult to do, uh, and uh, assert that, that you are still eligible by you know, submitting the, the uh, information anew. So yes, and you can, and the one, uh, the one great thing about, uh, about their process, unlike the 8A program, you can continue to renew every two years. Um, one thing I might want to mention too, they do have um, sort of these random checks, and you have to be careful because they do everything electronically, which I've taken issue with uh, in the past, and I just had a, uh, a protest that I had to file uh, based upon this this decision that they made to do things electronically. They've had IT issues, problem problems with email, uh, and the reason I mention it is because before your let's say you get verified before uh, you, that two year period runs out, you can be contacted by uh, CVE, and they can ask questions things that perhaps, that perhaps they may have missed during the initial verification process, and they can ask you to provide them with additional information uh, for purposes of assuring that you do, in fact, uh, qualify for the program. So you have, to, you have to be alert that, okay, these emails may be coming in, and there are time frames within which I have to respond and provide information, or I can lose my status. Uh, it, it's become an issue from time to time where people either don't realize that they've gotten uh, email notifications from CVE or they don't, they don't get them, uh, which happened to be a case that I, that I dealt with. It got resolved, but it, it took filing a protest to get it resolved. Uh, if, my size standard, or if my size changes during the two-year status, and I grow out of being a small business, will my CVE certification be revoked? Well, if, if I put it to you this way, if the VA doesn't know, then then they're not gonna they're not gonna re, they're not gonna revoke it. They're not gonna throw you out of the out of the program. The way it's supposed to work, though, is when your status does change, uh, it's your responsibility to uh, to notify the VA that it has changed because at that point you no longer qualify for. For, to obtain further contracts uh, through the program. Uh, I am a new company as of January 1st, 2013, and I am 50% disabled by the VA and a sole member LLC. Does this make it easier to get CVE certified? Uh, I don't know if it makes a difference one way or the other, but you, I believe I heard, I heard 50%. Uh, you have to make sure that you're 51 percent uh, owned by the service disabled veteran, or you're never going to qualify. So if um, if you if you are 50 percent five zero, that's not gonna that's not gonna do it. You need to be 51 percent uh, owned. Do state and local governments recognize the SDVO certification? Some do, uh, and you're and you're seeing that trend. Uh, begin to uh, begin to happen in different places uh, across the country. In in Pennsylvania, where I am, you're seeing it. Uh, in other states, you're seeing it uh, as well. So, it, and it's it's actually a good point because you are seeing things like women-owned small businesses, uh, disadvantaged uh, business enterprises (DBEs) as they're known in in various different places up here being recognized uh, in places. Uh, you know, like, like state government and local government. Uh, here in Philadelphia, where, where I am, you have uh, on all municipal contracts, you have minority business goals that are very high. And, and so from, the, and from that standpoint, it's, it's important to understand that things like service disabled veteran owned small business status uh, can help you not just simply at the federal level, but it can help you at the state and the municipal level as well. Uh, do you have to pay a fee to obtain the certification? You know what? That's a that's a good question. I, I don't know if there's if there is a a fee as part of the application process. Not being an applicant myself and 
re just simply representing them. Uh, I don't know, but my guess is if there is one, it's de minimis. It's not. It's not a large fee. Um, that may be our last uh, question. So if anybody else has, oh, we just got one more. Let me write this. Sure. Uh, okay. To, cl to clarify my question, I guess this was the uh, the one that mentioned that he started his business uh, January first. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, he says I am 100% owner, retired military with a 50% disability from the VA. Does oh, okay. This make it easier to be certified. Okay, gotcha. Okay, the the percentage of uh, the disability uh, will not make a difference one way or the other, and it it, it can be from zero percent to one hundred percent, and that's exactly how they define a disability. Uh, so the percentage of the disability itself will not uh, make a difference one way or the other in terms of the ease with which you are. Uh, uh, verified, you're still going to have to hit all the other criteria, regardless of what the uh, of what the percentage disability is that you have. Okay, great. Uh, another question here: If I participate in a bid for an SVVO set aside, uh, and I have been certified as such, can the SBA still claim that I don't qualify? You're gonna. I'm sorry, I missed the front half of that. I'm sorry. Could you read that again? Uh, if the let me see here. If I participate in a bid for an SCVO uh, set aside, and the and I have been certified as such, can the SBA claim that I don't qualify? Can the S if it's a VA procurement, the VA is. Uh, the, the entity that determines whether you are or are not uh, a veteran-owned business. The one difference is with respect to size. I had said during the presentation, uh, I made reference to the fact that the, the SBA is the arbiter of size, and that remains to be the case. And it can make, uh, it can make issues between the VA and the SBA on these issues a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing. But if, if there is a protest uh, on a VA procurement, and that protest goes to a size issue, then the VA must refer uh, that issue to the SBA for a determination. So that's the one area where the SBA can influence uh, one way or, or another whether somebody qualifies. It's a, but it's, it's strictly uh, based upon size. Uh, what is the number one reason applications get rejected? Well, I can tell you what it used to be. One of the number one uh, reasons used to be rights of first refusal, and but that's but that doesn't exist anymore because of the um, the Miles case that I referenced uh, that just came out about a month ago, month and a half ago. Uh, most of the time, what ends up happening is you have voting restrictions which uh, will infringe upon uh, an owner's, a veteran owner's ability to in fact uh, exert uh, the requisite ownership and control uh, over the company itself, which results in a denial of, of uh, a verification. If, if, there is, uh, if there are voting restrictions of any kind, let's say it's a, it's a a corporation and the veteran owns 51 percent. If the minority owners uh, can can uh, overcome a vote by the 51 percent majority holder on anything of any substance, then it's going to be uh, then that and a voting restriction like that is uh, is going to result in the company being denied. Uh, verified status, uh, supermajority provisions in a uh, set of corporate documents will result in a denial of um, uh, verified status. Uh, that's probably the biggest hurdle that folks have to overcome now. And, but you can you can uh, go on to the VA's website, and if you walk through the verification assistance briefs that are found on the um, on the, the VIP website, the, the veteran information uh, pages, if you, if you read through those, it will tell you 
what the biggest pitfalls are, and that's one of them. Again, right of first refusal used to be another one, but you don't have to worry about that one anymore. The biggest one still uh, is probably voting restrictions. Okay, super. I think that is, uh, that's it for questions. So this will wrap up our session. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, our friends over at Fierce Government and Fed Bidspeed for helping to promote our webinar series. Uh, special thanks to Ed Delisle, a uh, great presentation on the certification and answering all the, the good questions that we had. And thanks to all the participants who have joined us. This session, as I mentioned, is being recorded. And we'll send out the slides and the audio uh, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours. Anything you wanted to add, Ed? No, that's it. Thank you very much for participating. The questions uh, were great. And if anyone uh, has any further questions that went unanswered, or if you think of things after we end here, uh, my information is there. Please feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Super. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.